All right, engineers, so in this video, we are gonna talk about upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron lesions. Let's go and get started. All right, so when we talk about upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron lesions, we first have to understand what in the heck is an upper motor neuron and what is a lower motor neuron. Now, to make this very simple and kind of straightforward here, there's two types of upper motor neurons. Let's write these down. So the first upper motor neurons are two paths or two tracks, if you will. The first one that I want us to talk about here is called the corticospinal tract. And we're gonna make this very basic. The second one is called the corticobulbar tract. And again, we're gonna cover this basic. So upper motor neurons, where do they start? Well, look at the name. It kind of gives you where it starts, cortico. So it's kind of giving you the direction. Cortico spinal, going from cortex to spinal cord. Cortico bulbar, cortex to the bulb of the brainstem. We'll talk about what that means. So let's kind of start up here. Upper motor neurons, they begin up here in the cerebral cortex, right? So here's your cerebral cortex. And what areas of the cerebral cortex would they be coming from? The motor areas, there's a ton of them, right? We talked about all these in the descending tract video on the corticospinal tracts. But it could be the primary motor, the premotor, the primary somatosensory, the supplementary motor area, all of those. But they give off their axons, right? Coming down via what's called the corona radiata. Then they come down through the internal capsule. And as they come down here through the midbrain, through the pons, at the medulla, we know that they actually decussate. We're not going to show that here. But we're going to follow this one down all the way to the spinal cord. And what happens is these guys, they give off their axons to these lower motor neurons, the cell bodies in the anterior gray horn. So what is this tract here? This tract here going from the cortex all the way down to the spinal cord, that's our corticospinal tract. Right? The other tract is the corticobulbar tract. Let's do this in a different color so we can't separate them. So same thing, you're gonna have all these motor neurons coming from the premotor, the primary motor, the supplementary motor, all these different areas, and they're gonna give off their axons. That's gonna come down through the corona radiata, through the internal capsule, through the midbrain. Now, as this comes down at the kind of the mid-level of the pons and down, it gives off axons. To what structures? To this nucleus, to this nucleus, and this guy. This is going from the cortex to specific cranial nerve nuclei located in the pons and medulla. Now, if you look here, the corticospinal, corticobulbar, that's our upper motor neurons. The lower motor neurons are the destination or endpoints of these tracks. So what are the lower motor neurons? That's an important thing. Let's do it in a different color. Make it purdy, right? The lower motor neurons, there's two types. What is this one here? Well, it's actually correlated. Corticospinal. So cortex to the spinal cord. What part of the spinal cord? The anterior gray horn. So the anterior gray horn is where our lower motor neurons are. And then obviously from the anterior gray horn, they give off axons. And we'll talk about that. The second component is the destination of the corticobulbar pathway. That's particular cranial nerve nuclei. So this is going to be where you have cranial nerve nuclei. Now my next question for you guys is what cranial nerve nuclei are the destination points for the corticobulbar pathway? Let's, like, let's write them down. The first one here is actually gonna be this red one. These are only motor nuclei. The first one is cranial nerve five. What is this? The trigeminal nerve. What muscles does that go to? Muscles of mastication. Next one, in green, cranial nerve seven, facial nerve, muscles of facial expression. This big blue nucleus is actually consisting of what's called the nucleus ambiguous, okay? Now the nucleus ambiguous gives off axons for three particular nerves. You guys know which ones they are? Cranial nerve, nine, glossopharyngeal nerve. Cranial nerve, 10, vagus nerve. And the cranial component of the accessory nerve. These guys are gonna go to the muscles of your pharynx, your larynx, your soft palate, uvula, all things for speech, for swallowing, for articulation. Oh, beautiful. And the last one here is this pink one. And this is going to be cranial nerve 
12. What is this one? Your hypoglossal nerve. A hypoglossal nucleus, which gives off the hypoglossal nerve, which goes to the muscles of the tongue. So now we understand the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. Now, to get a little bit more specific, right? Obviously, these nuclei give off axons that go to muscles of the tongue. And same thing here. All the actual cranial nerves, 9, 10, and 11, will go out to the muscles of the larynx, pharynx, soft palate, uvula. All the axons from the facial nerve will go to the muscles of facial expression. And all the axons of the trigeminal motor nucleus will go to the muscles of mastication. So from the nucleus all the way out, axon, all the way out to the axon terminal bulb, that consists of the entire lower motor neuron. Same thing, come down to the corticospinal part where we go to the anterior gray horn. Again, cell bodies in the anterior gray horn, it's actually this color, cell bodies in the anterior gray horn have their axons and their axon terminal bulbs, which terminate at particular skeletal muscles. Maybe this is the skeletal muscles of the upper limbs, skeletal muscles of the lower limbs, skeletal muscles of the trunk. But all of these is going to be making up your lower motor neurons, going to the particular skeletal muscle. So we understand that now. Now, to make it pretty much obvious here, if you damage this upper motor neuron anywhere from the part up here in the cerebral cortex all the way down this entire path anywhere here, that is an upper motor neuron lesion. If you damage any of the nuclei or the nerve itself or the axon terminal of these cranial nerve nuclei, that is a lower motor neuron lesion. Same thing here. If you damage here, here, or here, that is a lower motor neuron lesion. Oh, that's so cool. But now that we understand upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons, their basic anatomy and function, and we understand the lesions, where they would take place, let's talk about a couple causes of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron lesions. So we know upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons, their components, their basic functions, right? The next thing we have to talk about is obviously some of the causes of upper motor neuron lesions. Okay. Some of the potential causes, you got to think about this. There's many different causes. I don't want us to get bogged down into all the random, pretty much, you know, rare stuff. I want us to get the basic concept. If you have to pick one of the main causes of an upper motor neuron lesion, you want to think about stroke. So if someone has a stroke, a CVA, right? Whether that be a hemorrhagic CVA or whether that be an ischemic CVA, cerebrovascular accident, that can cause damage to any component of the upper motor neuron. The second thing, is sometimes, if you think about the upper motor neuron, right? So here we start in the cortex, we go down with the axon, you go to the axon terminal, right? To your lower motor neuron. We'll just make this component here our lower motor neuron, right? And that will go out to your skeletal muscle. Sometimes what can happen is you can also demyelinate the axons of these upper motor neurons. What are some conditions that demyelinate axons? You know, there's conditions like multiple sclerosis. This can actually demyelinate the axons of the corticospinal tract. There's another condition called Frederick's ataxia. This can also demyelinate that. There's also B12 deficiency. This can also demyelinate that. You know what else? There's also another disorder, a motor neuron disease. And it can damage these structures here due to free radical accumulation. You know what this is called? ALS, a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. Okay, so we know some basic causes of upper motor neuron lesions, with the most common being stroke. But don't forget your demyelinating conditions and your motor neuron disease. Now, the other component here, let's do this in pink, is your lower motor neuron lesions right? Your lower motor neuron lesions. You got to think about this same concept here. When you talk about lower motor neuron lesions, you're talking about a damage to a couple different points here. Let's draw another small little mini diagram here. When you think about this here, we're going to draw spinal cord. And here is going to be 
your anterior white your anterior gray horn right here right so coming from this point here here's the cell body going out via the axons to the nerve which will go to the muscle if you damage this nerve at any point whether it be the cell body the nerve or the axon terminal that would cause a lower motor neuron lesion what are some causes that damage the anterior gray horn viruses. You know, there's a, a specific type of viral infection. Thank goodness we don't see it that often anymore. But polio, poliomyelitis is one. You know what another one is? West Nile virus. And you know, there's a terrible genetic condition that plagues infants that can also damage the anterior gray horn. This is called spinal muscular atrophy. So it's called spinal muscular atrophy. This is an autosomal recessive condition. Now, what about the nerve? So we already talked about if it was the anterior gray horn, we already talked about that, and then we have the axon, and then we have the axon terminals. We've already talked about the anterior gray horn. What about damage to the axon? Any kind of neuropathy. So you know if there is something like um, cauda equina syndrome? Cauda equina syndrome is actually whenever there's maybe herniation of the disc and it compresses the cauda equina. That could be an example of a type of radiculopathy in this case. So cauda equina syndrome. What else? What if there's just damage to the actual axon because of a peripheral neuropathy? Diabetes. You know diabetic neuropathy? So diabetic neuropathy would be another common cause here. So if there's diabetic neuropathy. So that can cover some of the causes for the this compo component, right? So there could be herniated discs or some type of spinal stenosis compressing the, in this case, the, the nerve root or the axons or diabetic neuropathy. The last thing is think about something that plagues this axon terminal. We actually asked this in one of the questions of the day. Use it for Botox, the botulinum toxin. So botulism, botulism can also inhibit acetylcholine release at the axon terminal. All right, and the last one here, which is very important, I don't want you to forget it, is you remember how we talked about <clears throat> ALS, right? ALS, you have the upper motor neuron coming down here to our lower motor neuron, right? And we talked about how ALS can plague and damage the upper motor neuron. Well, guess what? ALS is a tricky son of a gun. It also has the ability to damage lower motor neurons. So you can see someone who has both upper motor neuron lesion-like symptoms and lower motor neuron lesion symptoms present in ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis. All right, beautiful. Now, with that being said, I want to finish off and I want to talk about uh, one more thing before we go over the characteristics differentiating upper versus lower motor neuron lesions. The last thing I want to talk about, and we'll have another video discussing this, but there's a special name that I really want to make sure that you guys understand here. Cortical bulbar, right, the pathway itself, it's an upper motor neuron. Whenever there's damage of the cortical bulbar pathway, it produces a specific type of upper motor neuron lesion that we love to give a name to. And this is called pseudo bulbar palsy. Okay? And the other situation here, if there's damage to the destination of the cortical bulbar tract, where does that go to? Your cranial nerve nuclei, five, seven, uh, eight, nine, I'm sorry, nine, 10, 11, and 12. If there's damage to those nuclei or their fibers that are exiting, this is called bulbar palsy. And again, this is a type of lower motor neuron lesion. We'll discuss these in more detail in another video, but the basic concepts of these are going to be based on this foundation that we build with upper and lower motor neuron lesions. All right, so we built our concept of what an upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, lesions, causes, a couple terminology, things that we had to get uh, straight first. Now what I wanna do is, instead of just memorizing a chart, because that's easily what we could do, knowing an upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron lesion based on a chart kind of aspect, I really want us to understand why mass is affected, why there's fasciculations, why there's a difference in tone and reflexes and strength and so on and so forth between these two lesions. So let's go through by each concept here, starting with the mass. The, in other words, is there a decrease in the size of the muscle? Atrophy, in which there is in both of these lesions, but what is the difference and how is there atrophy? So let's start first with an upper motor neuron lesion. So. When we refer to mass, we're referring basically, in this case, the muscle mass. 
and we're referring to this with respect to upper motor neuron lesions. Now, upper motor neuron, we know that this can involve cell body, axon, or terminal, anywhere from the cortex to the spinal cord. In this case, we're using corticospinal as an example. The same concept would apply with corticobulbar. We're just using corticospinal. If there's damage to this corticospinal tract, here's what I want you to think. This is how I think about it. Cortex is in that word, corticospinal. It's coming from the cortex. The cerebral cortex controls vol its voluntary decision and control over skeletal muscle movement. In other words, I'm going to tell my biceps brachii to contract. My, ver my cerebral cortex had me a bit, had, gave me the voluntary ability to decide to do that. I'm not going to contract my biceps. My cerebral cortex gave that volitional decision. If you damage the corticospinal pathway, you take away the connection from the cortex and the spinal cord, your, and in this case, your lower motor neuron. Now, if you take away the cortex's decision to uh, and basically contract your skeletal muscle, you're not going to be able to use that. Right? So if you can't voluntarily decide to contract the muscle, you don't use it. And remember that saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. This situation here, because of the patient who has an upper motor neuron lesion, they're not constantly having voluntary control and usage of their skeletal muscles. They develop a special type of atrophy. And this type of atrophy that you experience here is called disuse. So it's called disuse atrophy. Okay, and this is because they lose volitional control of skeletal muscle contraction. Now, the second thing I want you to understand here with respect to mass is yes, there is a decrease in mass with an upper motor neuron lesion, but nowhere near the degree in comparison to lower motor neuron lesions. So there is a decrease in mass, maybe anywhere from 15 to 20% decrease in muscle mass in comparison to lower motor where they lose 70 to 80% of their muscle mass. Why? All right. Here we have our lower motor neuron lesion, right? And for whatever reason, we damage the anterior horn neurons, the cell body, we damage the axon, we damage the axon terminal, whatever. In that situation, what does that lead to? You damage the nerve, what does this nerve release at this muscle synapse? It releases acetylcholine, ACH, right? That's how we're gonna represent it. Acetylcholine has two types of functions on the skeletal muscle. One is it binds onto these nicotinic receptors. And when it binds onto the nicotinic receptors, it allows ions to flow in, and that leads to muscle contraction, right? We understand that, that's a simple concept. The other thing is acetylcholine can also bind onto other types of receptors, like musk receptors, that play a role in something very interesting. In other words, it can lead to like a cell signaling pathway that stimulates what's called transcription factors. Now you know transcription factors are important because guess what they can do? You have a transcription factor, it can move in and actually do something to the DNA. Here let's actually say here we have some DNA. And there's specific genes here that are responsible when stimulated by these transcription factors lead to the synthesis of muscle proteins. Lead to the synthesis of muscle proteins. So in other words this is called protein synthesis. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Let's follow this. If there's damage to the lower motor neuron, there's a loss of or significant decrease in acetylcholine. Obviously, that's going to impair the muscle contraction. We're not gonna talk about that. But what it will do is you'll then lose the pathway that'll lead to intracellular signaling and leading to the activation of transcription factors. This will be significantly decreased. If there's a decrease in transcription factors, there's a decrease in the genetic expression of particular types of muscle proteins. If there's a decrease in multiple muscle proteins, there's a decrease in protein synthesis. If there's a decrease in protein synthesis, guess what happens? You know in a muscle, there's a fine line, right? So in other words, if you kind of imagine like a little seesaw here, here we're gonna have PS, protein synthesis, and over here we're gonna have protein degradation, right, or proteolysis. In this case, what's happening here? The protein synthesis is decreasing. So because of that, now the protein degradation is going to overcome that. 
And because of that, because there is a significant decrease in protein synthesis, this will eventually lead to what's called proteolysis. And you know the muscle proteins make up a huge mass of the muscle. If you lose that, guess what happens? It leads to atrophy of the muscle. But this is a special type of atrophy. And again, this is present only with lower motor neuron lesions. What is this called? You've basically cut the nerve. You've cut the connection between the nerve to the muscle. So this is called denervation atrophy. Denervation atrophy. And the muscle mass that you're going to lose in this situation is going to be much, much more. There's going to be a significant decrease in mass, maybe 70 to 80% decrease in muscle mass with lower motor neuron lesions. Now, let's talk about the next concept, fasciculations. All right, so now let's talk about fasciculations. Now, here's the beautiful thing about fasciculations. Thank goodness, right? Fasciculations you really only see with lower motor neuron lesions. So really, truly, when we talk about fasciculations, we really only see this with lower motor neuron lesions. Let me explain why. Okay. Now, when we talk about fasciculations, what first we have to know is what in the heck is fasciculations? Fasciculations is a involuntary, right? Involuntary pathological muscle contraction. Involuntary pathological muscle contraction. It's kind of like um, if you have a muscle twitch, right? So but a muscle twitch is usually a benign thing. And so sometimes if you get like a little twitching of like the eyelid or twitching of like a muscle, that's pretty much what a fasciculation is in a, in a way, except that's benign. And one of the common areas that we can see this in is the tongue, so which is served by the hypoglossal nerve. So fasciculations, um, let's explain what happens with these. So here we have a particular neuron. What is this neuron? This is our lower motor neuron, right? So this is our lower motor neuron because we only see fasciculations with lower motor neuron lesions. If there's damage to the cell body in the anterior gray horn, the axon or the axon terminal of the lower motor neuron, what do you lose the release of? We already talked about it above. Acetylcholine, we'll represent that with ACH. What we know is that acetylcholine binds onto these little nicotinic receptors, this green receptor here. When it binds onto it, it opens up because it's called, it's called a chemically gated uh, or ligand gated ion channel. When acetylcholine binds, it opens up the channel and allows for sodium ions to flow into the cell. And then obviously as positive ions accumulate, it'll lead to a, eventually an action potential. And then muscle contraction, right? But what happens is, is whenever there's damage to this lower motor neuron, there's a significant decrease of acetylcholine. Now, whenever there's a decrease in acetylcholine, what happens is acetylcholine has to bind onto the acetylcholine receptor, right? But what happens is that there's not as much acetylcholine, so it binds onto, there's less act, uh, interaction with the acetylcholine receptors. The muscle thinks that, oh, there's not enough acetylcholine receptors because I'm not getting enough stimulation to the muscle. So what I need to do is, I need to increase the synthesis of acetylcholine receptors. And so it starts making more acetylcholine receptors to express onto the membrane. So that way, now, wherever acetylcholine is, when it binds, it'll increase the uh, kind of signaling inside of the cell and action potentials and muscle contraction, and all that stuff. So what is this called? So whenever there is a decrease in acetylcholine, this leads to what's called, so here we have this decrease in acetylcholine. There's decreased acetylcholine receptor activity. Your muscle responds to that by doing what's called upregulation. So in other words, it increases the number of acetylcholine receptors so that we may be able to respond, respond to the acetylcholine and increase muscle contraction. Here's the problem with that. Whenever you increase the number of these acetylcholine receptors, right? So here's an acetylcholine receptor, all of these. Guess what happens? Now these are generally chemically or ligand gated ion channels. But sometimes what happens is when you have so many of them, they become sensitive, mechanically sensitive. In other words, some type of tapping of the muscle may activate these channels to open up a little bit. And when they open up a little bit, guess what happens? Sodium ions start flowing in. And since you have more acetylcholine receptors, you have more sodium ions flowing in. 
And as more sodium ions flow into the cell, what happens? The cell becomes more positive. And what that does is that takes the resting membrane potential and moves it towards threshold potential. That leads to an action potential. And then that action potential leads to muscle contraction. But this muscle contraction is pathological. And this is what we see with fasciculations. So to basically summarize, damage to the lower motor neuron leads to decrease in acetylcholine, decreased interaction with the acetylcholine receptors, decreased signaling and activity via the uh, acetylcholine receptors. Your muscle cell responds to that thinking that it needs to make more acetylcholine receptors, which is called upregulation. As you upregulate and make more acetylcholine receptors, they become sensitive to mechanical stimuli and that allows for more ions to come in and this will lead to muscle contractions, but this type of muscle contraction is called fasciculations. Now, there's another term that comes up sometimes and I wanna make sure that we clarify what the heck it is. Another term that comes up sometimes is what's called, so there is what's called fasciculations. This is seen only in lower motor neuron lesions, but there's another thing called fibrillations. What is fibrillations? Because you also see these in lower motor neuron lesions. Fibrillations are basically fasciculations that are expressed on a EMG. So you only see these on an EMG, which is kind of an electrical myogram. So in other words, you have to monitor the activity of the muscle. So if you're looking at like an EMG, this you'll have these kind of like fasciculations. That is what we see when we're actually kind of looking at the muscle activity. So fasciculations are visible, pathological, involuntary contractions of the muscle, while fibrillations are basically a representation of fasciculations on an electromyogram. Okay, now that we know the, what fasciculations are, what we see them in, and how they're produced, let's now go on to the next thing, tone and reflexes and things. All right, so this is where it gets a little difficult when we talk about upper versus lower motor neuron lesions, but this is the bread and butter. This is the main thing that we have to understand when it comes to upper versus lower motor neuron lesions. And this is referring to tone, deep tendon reflexes, and strength. Okay, so let's have one category over here, this being our upper motor neuron lesions. And then over here, being our lower motor neuron lesions. Okay, let's first talk about the tone of the muscle. Okay, we have to start with our corticospinal fibers, our pathway. We're not gonna go ham on it, I just want you to know the basic concept here. You have your cells, your neurons, right, that start here in the cerebral cortex and they move their way down. Obviously, if you guys want to hit it along with me, corona radiata, internal capsule, and then they move down, right? Via the midbrain, via the crust cerebri, down through the pons. And then as they come here in the medulla, what happens? They cross, right? We know that they cross over via the pyramidal decussation, and then they descend downwards here into the lateral white column, right? So then they'll move into the lateral white column as what's called your lateral corticospinal tract and eventually what will happen is they'll terminate here on your lower motor neurons now this is your upper motor neuron right this is your corticospinal tract and when it terminates here it terminates on these lower motor neurons here and these lower motor neurons will actually come and go and stimulate your skeletal muscle. There's actually two types though, and we'll talk about that in a second, two types of lower motor neurons in this situation here. But this is the basic concept, upper motor neuron, corticospinal coming down and acting on your lower motor neuron. Now here's the big thing, your corticospinal fibers, remember, it's voluntary control. In other words, I have the ability to stimulate this muscle, this nerve to, in other words, generate an action potential and contract the muscle or I have the decision to inhibit it. I have that ability with my cerebral cortex. Here's what's really cool. Okay, on the way down, these cortical fibers can give off little collaterals that can act on these green nuclei. They can act on these green nuclei. What are these green nuclei called? These are very important. It's in your medulla. 
and it's actually a part uh, kind of like an extension of the reticular formation. These are called your medullary reticulo spinal uh, nuclei, right? So this is your med medullary reticulospinal nuclei, and they're going to give off their axons, right? And these axons will come down here. And we're just going to bring them down here. They'll actually go into the anterior column. But we're just going to have them come straight down here to these lower motor neurons here. Okay? And these medullary reticular nuclei will give off their axons that will come down here and act on the lower motor neurons. Here's what I want you to remember. The cortical fibers that come and give off collaterals to these medullary reticular nuclei, guess what they are? They're stimulatory. So they will stimulate the medullary reticular nuclei. The medullary reticular nuclei will give off their tracts, and guess what their tracts do to these lower motor neurons? They primarily inhibit the lower motor neurons. They inhibit the lower motor neurons, whereas this corticospinal can stimulate or inhibit. Let's just focus on the medullary reticular, though. So here's another lower motor neuron coming out here. Again, what will this medullary reticular tract do? Reticulospinal uh, nuclei do? They'll inhibit the lower motor neuron. Now. Let's talk about the lower motor neuron. The lower motor neurons, they have axons that go out to your skeletal muscle, but there's two types of fibers, right? The red fiber, let's actually do it with the red color here. This neuron here going to the red fibers, which is your extra fusal fibers. This is your alpha motor neuron. That causes the extra fusal fibers to contract and shorten the muscle, right? Generating movement. The other one here, which we're going to do here in this blue color, is going to your muscle spindles, which are your intrafusal fibers. This is called your gamma motor neuron. They contract the intrafusal fibers. And whenever those intrafusal fibers contract, what did they activate? I know you guys remember this from that muscle spindle video. What are those fibers that wrap around that muscle spindle and give off their axons? This is your type 1A and 2 afferents. And they'll go into the spinal cord, right? And generate a reflex, that spinal, uh, what? The muscle spindle stretch reflex. Okay, here's where all of this stuff comes in. Now that we've ba built this basis, now here's what I want you to remember. If you have an upper motor neuron lesion, you damage somewhere in this part here, right? We've damaged this. Guess what you lose? you lose the stimulation of this medullary reticulospinal nuclei. So now this is no longer going to stimulate this medullary reticulospinal nuclei. If this is no longer stimulated, it's going to be inhibited. Now that means less action potentials are coming down to this lower motor neuron. What types of action potentials? Less inhibitory action potentials. So now this is going to be able to stimulate the lower motor neuron. So again, this right here, you damage the upper motor neuron, you lose uh, the stimulation of the medullary reticulospinal nuclei, then because you lose that, you lose the inhibition, and now you have increased stimulation of the lower motor neurons. If there's increased stimulation of the alpha motor neuron, that's gonna cause increased contraction of the extrafusal fibers. If there's increased activity of the gamma motor neurons, that's gonna cause increased contraction of the muscle spindles and increase reflex pathway. So what does that lead to? What did we say? Because there's damage to the corticospinal fibers, you lose uh, the stimulation of the medullary reticulospinal tract, and there because of that there's disinhibition of the lower motor neurons, increased firing of both the alpha and gamma motor neurons. Now, if there's increased firing of the alpha motor neuron, what this does is, is this leads to an increase in muscle tone, right? And you know what they call that increase in muscle tone? They call this hypertonia, hypertonia. The other thing is if there is an increase in the gamma motor neuron activity, there's increased contraction of the muscle spindle, right? And if there's increased contraction of the muscle spindle, Guess what happens? 
If you go and you do what's called a patellar reflex, right? So in other words, you take your, your uh, hammer and you smack down on the patellar tendon. What did we say it does in that stretch reflex video? It stretches the intrafusal fibers, activates the type 1A and type 2. They send their action potentials into the spinal cord, right? And then what do they do? They synapse on these lower motor neurons, activating them to go and cause increased contraction of the skeletal muscle, right? If you already have increased, increased activity of the gamma motor neuron going to that muscle spindle, it's already super sensitive. You tap the patellar tendon, guess what happens to this reflex? Super hyper reflexic. So now, if this muscle spindle is already really sensitive, you tap the tendon, Guess what's going to happen? This is going to lead to a super hyperactive afferent pathway. And if you have an increased uh, afferent pathway, guess what happens when it stimulates this lower motor neuron? It's going to increase the alpha motor neuron activity and it's going to cause the muscle to contract. And guess what happens? It's going to be super reflexic, right? You're going to have hyperreflexia. Why is that? Because there's increased gamma motor neuron activity. That means increased sensitivity of muscle spindles. So then, whenever you tap that patellar tendon, you already have hyperactive, super sensitive muscle spindles. They're gonna increase the, what's called, what's that called? The stretch reflex pathway. The stretch reflex. And that stretch reflex is gonna be super hyperactive that that's gonna lead to what's called hyper reflexia. Woo! That's increased deep tendon reflexes. So we know two things so far. There's increase in muscle tone because of the increased alpha motor neuron activity, because of the disinhibition of the medullary reticulospinal tract, and increased gamma motor neuron activity. And the problem with that is you have increased sensitivity of the muscle spindles. Whenever you tap that tendon, it increases the activity of the stretch reflex pathway, increasing the activity of the alpha motor neurons, and increasing your reflexes. Now, there's another thing we have to understand here. Because of this hypertonia and hyperreflexia, this produces a special type of paralysis, if you will. When we talk about this, because there's so much tone and so much reflexia, uh, hyperreflexia, this is very what's called spastic in nature. So this type of paralysis that we see in upper motor neuron lesions is called spastic paralysis. And paralysis in this case is where we see the decrease in strength. So there is a decrease in strength in this situation. But the type of paralysis that we see with an upper motor neuron lesion is spastic paralysis. Now, really quickly, I have to just, just quickly completely differentiate spasticity from rigidity because these are two completely different types of things spasticity we see with upper motor neuron lesions right and then for example we'll talk about this more when we do the neurophysical exam right but when, when you're doing a physical exam on someone and you're assessing their tone you know, okay in other words the, re, the resistance to muscle movement you're just going to kind of be moving their arm with someone who has upper motor neuron lesion the muscles are kind of contracted Right? So they're hypertonic. And as you're moving, they have resistance to that passive movement. But with spasticity, it's what's called velocity dependent. In other words, it, it can actually increase resistance with increased speed of the movement. Another big thing here, not only is it velocity dependent, but the spasticity is only in one direction. All right? So if I'm moving, I'm flexing the arm, there might be re resistance to that direction, but no resistance or no significant resistance in the opposite direction. Rigidity is velocity independent, and the, re the resistance is in both directions. Okay, another thing. When we're talking about spasticity versus rigidity, rigidity is something that you see more with Parkinson's disease. What do Parkinson's patients usually have? Tremors, right? So they'll have tremors. Spasticity, generally, there's no tremors. Another thing that's important to remember here is that in spasticity and sp types of paralysis, there's weakness. In rigidity and conditions like Parkinson's disease, there's no significant weakness in comparison to that. Okay?
The last thing I want to talk about, and we'll discuss this more when we get into the neurophysical exam, but with spasticity, there's a special type of neuro finding that you see, and it's called the clasp knife phenomenon, okay? We'll talk about this more in uh, our neurophysical exam, but the simple concept of it is that if you're doing a physical exam and you're assessing their passive movement, let's say that you're trying to just assess their flexion, passive flexion at the elbow. As you move, right, in this flexion direction, there's gonna be a lot of resistance and resistance and resistance, and eventually, guess what happens? It gives out, and then it just starts to relax. That's an example of spasticity, a clasp knife phenomena. We'll talk about other terms with rigidity, where in Parkinson's patients, they have lead pipe rigidity. In other words, their arm is rigid the entire flexion and extension. And there's another one called cogwheel rigidity. And that's basically where they have this sense of rigidity or hypertonia, but there's tremors along the way. We'll talk about that more when we get into the neurophysical exam. But I just wanted to make sure that we differentiate that. So now we know the upper motor neuron lesions and the, what's happening to the tone, so the reflexes and the degree of strength. There's a decrease in strength in both of these. All right, and we understand the difference between spasticity and rigidity. Okay, now we gotta hit lower motor neuron lesions and we gotta talk about tone. And again, that comes to the alpha motor neuron. Okay, let's go ahead and come up to this diagram. Okay, in this situation, when we talk about lower motor neuron lesions, there's nothing, like that, that we have no problem here with the upper motor neuron. This is all intact. So in other words, that medullary reticulospinal tract is fine, the corticospinal tracts are fine. The problem is we have damage to the alpha motor neuron and to the gamma motor neuron. Whether it be at the nuclea, at the cell body level, the axon, the axon terminal, whatever, there's damage to this. Now because of that, that means you have decreased alpha motor neuron activity and decreased gamma motor neuron activity because you've damaged this lower motor neuron, whether it be at the cell body, the axon, or the axon terminal. Regardless of where it is, no matter what, the end result is there's decreased stimulation of the intrafusal fibers and decreased stimulation of the extrafusal fibers. We should already be able to pick this out now. Watch this, guys. If there is decreased activity of the alpha motor neuron because you've damaged the nerve, what happens to the tone? There's a decrease in tone. And if there's a decrease in tone, what is that called? Hypotonia. In other words, the muscles, in comparison, hypertonia is it's a lot of resistance. Hypotonia, the muscles are just like super floppy, right? Really flaccid. All right, so now we have a decreased muscle tone. The muscles are really floppy, right? Because there's decreased alpha motor neuron activity. In the same way, there's decreased gamma motor neuron activity. What does that mean? That's decreased stimulation of the intrafusal fibers or the muscle spindles. That means there's decreased sensitivity of the muscle spindles. If there's decreased sensitivity of the muscle spindles, whenever you try to take your reflex hammer, tap on that tendon and stretch the actual muscle fibers. You have stretch of the intrafusal fiber, the muscle spindles, but those type one A and type two sensory fibers, right? their activity moving into the spinal cord is decreased. Why? Because this muscle spindle is less sensitive because there's less gamma motor neuron activity. So that means less action potential is being carried via the 1A and 2 fibers. If there's less activity being carried through that 1A and 2 fibers, that means less stimulation of the lower motor neuron, less alpha motor neuron activity, and less reflexive strength or reflexive movement. So because of that, because there's decreased sensitivity of the muscle spindles, there's decreased stretch reflex activity. And if there's decreased stretch reflex activity, this leads to hyporeflexia. In other words, this is decreased deep tendon reflexes. Oh, that makes so much sense. And because these muscles are so flaccid and are very hypotonic and very hyporeflexic, this produces a specific type of loss in muscle strength called flaccid paralysis.
beautiful. So now we understand this concept of tone, deep tendon reflexes, and strength. Let's finish off strong with types of special tests. All right, so the last thing I want to do to take this home here is talk about some special tests. Now, these special tests, you're really only going to see these positive, in other words, pathological, signs of these tests in upper motor neuron lesions. We're going to explain why for one of those in particular. Okay, now, Lower motor, neuron, low motor neuron lesions, you're not going to see these pathological reflexes. What, are, what is the main one? I don't want you to forget this one. This is the main one. It's the Babinski sign, okay? Or the Babinski reflex. This is the main one that I really want you to understand. Now, we already know from what we talked about with the deep tendon reflexes just a second ago that in patients with upper motor neuron lesions, what are they? Hyperreflexic. But in this case, we, it's a special type of reflexia where they have what's called a positive Babinski sign in patient, patients with upper motor neuron lesions. What is the Babinski sign or reflex itself? Let's say that you take a patient here, right? And you have the, the, the bottom of their foot. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take like the tip of your reflex hammer, they're usually there's like a pointed edge, and you're gonna run that across from the kind of the, the bottom of the foot towards the top of the foot, moving laterally to medially, right? What that's gonna do is, it's gonna activate specific types of sensory receptors, right? And those sensory receptors are gonna take that information into your spinal cord, and it's gonna act on particular motor neurons, right? So this may act on particular motor neurons that'll come out and control particular muscles around the foot. You know what muscles it actually loves to stimulate via this reflex pathway? It actually loves to stimulate what's called your plantar flexors. What is plantar flexion? In other words, you're, you're doing like uh, calf raises. You're pointing your toes down, right? Whereas dorsiflexion is you're kind of pointing the toes towards the roof or towards the sky in that case. So this reflex, when I scrape that thing, what happens is the toes should naturally kind of curl. That should be the natural response. But here's what's very interesting. In an upper motor neuron lesion, you have something different. Okay, here we're gonna have another diagram. And here we're gonna have, coming down, here's our upper motor neuron, right? We'll draw like that little thing here. Here's our corticospinal tract. You'd have another one coming here too, right? So here's going to be the other corticospinal tract. As they're coming down, they give off their axons that go to particular motor neurons. Motor neurons that actually go to specifically the dorsiflexors, right? These go to your dorsiflexors. Now, dorsiflexors, again, we already said, point the toes towards like the roof or towards the sky. Normally, as these upper motor neurons are coming down, they actually generally inhibit your dorsiflexors a little bit more than your plantar flexors, right? Now, if someone has an upper motor neuron lesion, you damage this, right? That corticospinal tracts. What happens now? You lose the inhibition to this motor neuron going to the dorsiflexors. Now it's disinhibited. In other words, it's going to overfire. So now there's going to be increased action potentials coming down this axon and doing what? Stimulating the dorsiflexors so much more so that these dorsiflexors overcome the activity of the plantar flexors. So now, when you stroke the bottom of the foot and trigger this reflexive pathway, there may be some degree of plantar flexion, but because I damaged the upper motor neurons, the motor neurons, the lower motor neurons that are going to the dorsiflexors are going to overfire. So whenever you do this motion and kind of scrape the bottom of the foot, instead of normally the toes curling, Guess what happens? That big toe dorsiflexes, so it kind of points up towards the ceiling, and the other toes fan out. And that is called a positive Babinski sign. That is what we see with a upper motor neuron lesion. Here's one more thing that I have to say, it's very important. The Babinski reflex, right? You see it, a positive Babinski sign in an upper motor neuron lesion, but you know what else you can see it in? But it doesn't mean that it's pathological. You can see a positive Babinski's in children, babies, usually less than one year old. You wanna know why? 
You know these upper motor neurons? They're supposed to be myelinated, heavily myelinated. But as a baby is developing, during the embryological development of the nervous system, these upper motor neurons aren't heavily myelinated. So because the upper motor neurons, they have a decreased myelination, what happens is, it basically there's a decreased functioning of these corticospinal tracts in a way because they're not completely developed. And so naturally, there is some degree of hyperstimulation of the motor neurons going to the dorsiflexors. So that's why when you do it on a baby less than a year old, they may have a positive Babinski sign, but that doesn't mean that it's pathological. All right. The last thing that we need to talk about here, and I'm not gonna go over all the path, uh, pathophysiology of them, it's just something that I want you guys to know, we'll talk about in the neurophysical exam. But these patients who have upper motor neuron lesions also have a specific type of test, two other tests that can be positive, and this is called your pronator drift. Simply put, you take a patient, you have them kind of standing out with their arms in a kind of a, a supinated position, and you have them close their eyes, and sometimes what you can do is to accentuate it, you can tap on the arm. Naturally, what will happen is in pronator drift, if they have an upper motor neuron lesion, what happens is the pronators become a little bit more powerful than the supinators because the upper motor neuron lesion is actually causing uh, inhibition of the, uh, there's actually gonna be damage to the supinators, less supinator activity, more pronator activity. And what happens is the arm starts to kind of drift downwards and pronate at the same time, okay? So in this situation with the pronator drift, you see this with upper motor neuron lesions, okay? Same one, uh, same thing here with an upper motor neuron lesion, you also have another really cool sign. And this is called the Hoffman's sign. And what you do for this one is you actually have the patient kind of, you're holding their hand, and what you're doing is you're taking their middle finger here, and towards the end of that middle finger, you're kind of flicking at the end. And what naturally should happen is as you flick that in an upper motor neuron lesion, is your thumb and your actual uh, index finger here are gonna start to kind of approximate and come together. So you're kind of clicking there on that middle finger and what happens is naturally if someone has an upper motor lesion is, they're gonna have these two fingers come closer together, approximate. So that's another thing that you'd see in an upper motor neuron lesion. All right, so now that we've covered all of these individual characteristics, let's put it all together and go over it in this chart. Let's see what you guys remember. All right, so when we're talking about upper motor neuron lesions versus lower motor neuron lesions. Let's put everything together. Let's take everything that we've learned so far throughout this entire concept of all these different characteristics and put it together. So when we're looking at upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron lesions, we have all of these things that we've talked about. Let's cover each one. Okay, ready? First thing, upper motor neuron lesion, lower motor neuron lesion with respect to mass. What did we say for upper motor neurons? They both have a decrease in mass. But we said upper motor neuron lesions have a very minimal decrease in mass. So a minimal decrease being maybe only 15 to 20% decrease in mass. For the most part, mass is somewhat preserved to a degree in upper motor neuron lesions. For lower motor neuron lesions, there is a significant reduction in mass, somewhere between maybe 80% decrease in mass. Now, what do we say was the type of atrophy that we see in upper? we see disuse in lower denervation atrophy. Strength, what was the type of paralysis, they both have a decrease in strength, but what was the type of paralysis that you see in upper motor neurons? This is called spastic paralysis. This is called spastic paralysis. And when we talk about lower motor neurons, we're talking about flaccid paralysis. Beautiful. Tone. What did we say? Tone is basically dependent upon the alpha motor neurons. In upper motor neuron lesions, there's increased alpha motor neuron activity because of disinhibition of that medullary reticulospinal tract. So if there's an increase in tone because of that, you see that in upper motor neuron lesions. So you see an increase in tone. What does this refer to? It's called hypertonia. Whereas in lower motor neuron lesions, there's decrease of the lower motor neuron, there's less alpha motor neuron activity, less contraction of the skeletal muscle, particularly the extrafusal fibers. So there's a decrease in tone. This is referred to as hypotonia. Beautiful. Deep tendon reflexes. When we talk about upper motor neurons, what do we say? There's disinhibition of the medullary reticulospinal tract. That means increased stimulation of both alpha and gamma motor neurons. 
increased gamma motor activity causes increased contraction of the muscle spindle. And so whenever you tap that tendon, you have an increased stretch reflex pathway. That leads to hyperreflexia, so increased deep tendon reflexes, or what's called hyperreflexia. Whereas with a lower motor neuron activity, a uh, lesion, there's decreased gamma motor neuron activity. If there's decreased gamma motor neuron activity, there's decreased sensitivity of the muscle spindle, decreased stretch reflex pathway, and decreased reflexes. So we call that hyporeflexia. Beautiful. All right, so fasciculations, we talked about this already, right? We said that we only see this in lower motor neuron lesions. They're absent in upper motor neuron lesions. Why? Because this is particularly present due to a decrease in acetylcholine. There's only a decrease in acetylcholine release from the lower motor neuron lesions. So it's present, right, or positive, you could say, in the uh, lower motor neuron lesions. Same thing, fibrillations. What is fibrillations? It's the graphical representation of fasciculations, but on an EMG. Again, you don't see this, it's absent, and the upper motor neuron lesions, but it's present or positive, if you will, in the lower motor neuron lesions. Babinski, pronator drift, Hoffman signs. These are all special tests that we just talked about, and we said that we only see these positive or pathological in upper motor neuron lesions. So it is present in all of these, but we don't say negative when it comes to lower motor neuron lesions. It's all semantics, but technically we say that it is absent when it comes to the lower motor neuron lesions when it's with respect to these special tests. All right, so that's a nice little recap and brief kind of overview of what we talked about this entire video. I hope it made sense. All right, engineers, I hope you guys stuck in throughout this entire video. I appreciate you guys uh, being just amazing engineers. I hope all of this stuff made sense. If you guys did like this video, if you guys did enjoy it, if it did help, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we'll have links, links to our Facebook and our Instagram. Go, go join us, follow us on that as well. Also, I have a link to our Patreon if you guys want to click on that we also have different things that you guys can gain from that like uh, PDF pictures and a bunch of other goodies there too all right engineers we love you we thank you and as always until next time